Okay, the glucocorticoids. Okay, these are the ones that regulate sugar, salt, sugar, sex. Um, the two that I want to talk about and are the most important part of the story are cortisol, which is the biggie that people are usually talking about, but there's also corticosterone. They do slightly different things, but they're pretty similar to one another um, in their functionality. Um, and here's the big picture with um, the glucocorticoids, and I'm probably just going to say cortisol most of the time. They're super duper important in keeping you going when you can't, for instance, eat, when you can't or you won't eat. So um, super important to understand about these guys. This figure is no longer in your textbook, so I linked it right here. So I want to look first at this side which is the circadian rhythm causing regulation. And then we'll talk about stress as well. So the deal is that you still need circulating nutrients even when you're not taking them in. And of course we know this from the metabolism chapter. You still need glucose for the brain and you still need circulating nutrients for other things so that the brain can have the glucose. Even when you're asleep, even when you're really, really ill, even when you're super duper stressed. So, um, and we'll talk about stress a lot at the end of this set of notes. But for right now, when I, when I say stress, I'm not just thinking about mental stress. I'm thinking about injury as being a stress and starvation as being a stress and disease as being a stress. So broaden your definition of stress. It will include emotional stress. We'll see that at the end of this set of notes. But um, so cortisol and corticosterone, what they do is kind of on a, let's say on a regular daily basis. There are times when you are not eating, but your brain still needs glucose. Now those times are regulated primarily by your circadian rhythms that tells you, for instance, um, that daytime is the time when our metabolism should be a little higher. It's also the time when we're likely, more likely to be eating. Um, two o'clock in the morning, um, I'm probably going to need to be releasing stored nutrients to make sure that my, my brain stays alive, for instance. So what will happen is their circadian rhythms will cause the hypothalamus to secrete CRH. And then the anterior pituitary will respond by secreting, oops, sorry, by secreting um, ACTH. Um, ACTH, anti, um, adrenocorticotropic hormone, will go to the adrenal cortex and cause the release of cortisol, also corticosterone, but let's just focus on cortisol. And cortisol's job is really, just think about this, it will cause you to raise circulating nutrient levels. Even though we say it's about sugar, it's about sugar and then other things get raised so that the brain can have sugar. So raise circulating nutrient levels by any means necessary. But that means it's all well and good if it's released just when you're asleep or just when you're ill. But if you release it over and over a long periods of time, you're gonna trash your stores, okay? So it's going to raise blood glucose and other nutrient levels by causing, for instance, um, glycogenolysis. So you go to the, stop doing that. You go to the liver, and before you do gluconeogenesis, you also cause glycogenolysis, um, assuming there was any glycogen left anyway. And then once that's gone, you can do gluconeogenesis in the liver. But in the adipose tissue, you're also going to be causing lipolysis, and again, so that your brain can have the sugar and other things can eat fat. Um, and then if necessary, your muscle and other tissue, let's say you had a prolonged illness or the first trimester of pregnancy in which you really couldn't eat very much, um, you can cause um, uh, gluconeogenesis in your own muscle, not just gluconeogenesis of stored stuff. Um, so, or of circulating, um, circulating amino acids. So in muscle and other tissue, you can eventually cause protein break, breakdown. You are definitely not going to do any of these um, uh, anabolic processes. So basically this is considered a catabolic hormone because what's it, it, what it's actually going to do is to cause you to break down stored nutrients and dump them into your bloodstream so that you can stay alive until things get better. This is like emptying your savings account in the hopes that you're gonna get a job next week, okay? It was necessary because you needed to keep the lights on, but it, it is not without its, um, its problems. 
okay? In addition, um, here, any non-essential tissue that's probably not going to help with getting you through the night can just kind of suck it. You're not going to give them any glucose uptake to speak of or any amino acid uptake. So it's kind of like um, circling the horses, uh, circling the wagons, and um, just making sure that you have enough to get going through this this difficult time. So it is considered a catabolic steroid, whereas of course the androgens were considered anabolic steroids. So this one will start breaking things down. Now, um, it is involved in adapting the body for stress, both mental and physical stress. So the other thing besides circadian rhythms, which can cause um, a dependable level of cortisol release, is stress, mental and physical stress. So this is going to be important when we talk about stress at the end here. Okay, now the other thing that's interesting and it's clinically important is that if you administer this in large amounts or secrete it in large amounts, um, the um, this, you can use this as a medical treatment, uh, a clinical treatment, because um, the corticosteroids are the most powerful um, anti-inflammatories that we had. Remember way back when, when we, when we talked about paracrine agents and the fact that if you can inhibit the, um, prostaglandin pathway, um, you can stop all of that inflammation, inflammation and pain, and maybe even fever. Um, but, um, the medication that was most effective at doing that was a hormone mimic. What it is, is it's a cortisol mimic, like prednisone. Um, and these are called um, corticosteroids. Um, and they're powerful anti-inflammatories, but they've got their own set of problems associated with it. One of the things is, um, that is the problem with using them over long periods of time is that your immune system, the smart portion of your immune system, um, is really working on tomorrow, not today, and it's considered a non-essential tissue. And you will actually inhibit um, immune function with long-term use of these corticosteroids. Okay, a um, couple other things that this does. Like I said, this is the most complicated hormone. It's taken me years to get this kind of a grasp on it. Um, Cortisol, the glucocorticoids are necessary so that when you tell your vessels to constrict or dilate, they respond. That's all well and good. If you secrete it over long periods of time, though, it will keep your vessels slightly dilated. So anyway, it's, it's important for vessel responsiveness. It is also necessary, um, you have to have these hormones to support your metabolism before you will commit to growth. So thyroid hormone was kind of the same way. So before you commit to a high metabolism, you need to check, um, sorry, before you commit to growth, you need to check your metabolism with your thyroid hormone and you need to check your, um, whether you'll have enough nutrients with your cortisol. Um, oops, that's a misspelling. Glucocorticoids um, are absolutely necessary for life. You can't live without them because you won't get through the night. Your brain won't get through the night and they have to be, um, supplemented if they are, are hyposecreted. Okay, so what is the feedback mechanism for cortisol secretion? And this is one that's going to be kind of complicated to think about because the typical feedback mechanism is hormonal, yes, but since you can start the nervous system, the nervous system can start it. The nervous system can also not start it, right? So not no stress wouldn't start it, stress would start it. So it's actually a little bit of both combination of hormonal feedback of cortisol and then a combination of neural feedback with stress. So it's a little bit of both. Now, if this is confusing to you, it's because it's confusing. Um, we are going to take this and elaborate on it at the end of this set of notes as we talk about the hormonal stress response. And we'll talk quite a bit about cortisol, not only about cortisol, but quite a, quite a bit. Okay, so that's the